Hello and welcome to this review of my Mistel Barocco keyboard. This was a commercial donation from Mistel. As with the UHK I reviewed recently, ish, this is an ergonomic keyboard, and I'm gonna skip large parts of the ergonomic aspects of it, as it's frankly just not my area of expertise. Although I did use it split during gaming for a bit. Yeah, see, I'm all trying and shit. The Barocco is a split ergo keyboard in the mid-budget segment. To clarify, at the top segment, there's things like the UHK and Ergodox, which can be adjusted in multiple ways and which are in the $300 plus price range. And at the bottom you have things like the Microsoft Natural keyboard, which is not adjustable at all, everything's fixed into position, and which isn't even mechanical, it uses rubber domes. This can be had for around $60. The Barocco falls somewhere in between the two, it's around $150 and is fully split but not multi-adjustable, so it's not really made for tenting or the like, which is when the board is raised up like this. They do give you a couple of rubber nipples that you can prop the sides up with, but that's about it. Interestingly, unlike many Ergo keyboards, which tend to be either full size or 60%, this one is actually based on a 75% form factor. This is a compact form where they crammed as many buttons as they could in a fairly small package, allowing for relatively great control while retaining a fairly small footprint, but at the expense of many buttons being rather small and sometimes being in unusual locations. Personally, I kind of like 75 keyboards as far as space-saving keyboards go, although the quality of the layout on 75% keyboard varies a lot as it's not exactly standardized. Of course, I'm happiest with something like 144% form factor, but you know, that's just me. It sports a bunch of useful features such as macro programming, key remapping, switchability to Colmac and Dvorak for the true ergo lunatics out there, and four dip switches at the back to switch to Mac layout and switch to control and caps lock around, as well as one of the most unique things I've ever seen, they actually added a whole slew of extra keycaps with it. Now, at first some of these will make no sense because it includes a full numpad, which obviously you can't exactly use on a 75% layout, but these were added so that you could repurpose this set on a full-size keyboard. Nice, that's <laughs> really thoughtful actually, thanks guys. They even included a stepped caps lock key to replace the standard non-stepped one, which is excellent because unstepped caps lock keys tend to be rather fiddly in my experience. Between a normal, staggered keycaps and semi-programmable layout, plus a not too huge lack of buttons, this was not that bad for me to use. In fact, I used it for quite a bit longer than the usual week of testing, as I had some extra time on my hands, although by now I've switched back to a full size as the lack of a numpad was eventually starting to annoy me. Although you can get a separate numpad off of them as well, it seems. The switch is a Cherry MX RGB Brown, which is a version of MX Brown with a transparent top housing to facilitate more ostentatious backlighting. These are light linear switches with a somewhat rough key feel, which leads some people to claim that it's actually tactile, although I haven't really found any empirical evidence for this. Overall, I'd rather have MX Red, which are exactly the same except less rough and scratchy. Anyway, that's just personal preference. The RGB, meanwhile, is among the most annoying I've ever encountered in a keyboard. I switched it on again for a couple of these scenes, but I used it myself mostly with it off. It was so irritating that I got rid of it after just a few days. You can almost tell the devs didn't like RGB either and just put it on, simply because it's somehow a kind of faux pas to make a keyboard nowadays that doesn't light up like New Year's Eve. First of all, the quality is not very good, as you might be able to tell from the supposed yellow, the mixing isn't particularly good, and it looks a lot worse in person than this than it does in the camera, by the way. But also, it's just in the way. See, first of all, the way the switches are oriented, the LEDs are at the front rather than the more usual back of the keycap, and the housings are transparent, so the LEDs are visible from under the keycap and shine straight into your eyes, which is really rather blinding, much worse than it might show on the camera. I put the camera into such a position that it demonstrates what I see when I see it with the backlighting on, with this one showing kind of what's going on, and as should be obvious by now, this is really rather annoying. To make matters worse, the keycaps use non-transparent legends, which makes them quite hard to read if there's light coming from around them. 
Also, it uses orange rather than white lettering, so in semi-dark environments this gets quite challenging. This is with just my table light and the room light on. Now, I realize this is a conscious fashion choice, and don't get me wrong, I actually prefer the look like this. I think the orange lettering suits it quite well, but definitely with the backlighting off. If you do have the RGB on, I suggest at least switching it to orange, which looks kind of kick-ass, even if it's completely illegible. Interestingly, there's no supporting software, everything is configured keyboard side, which I'm a big fan of, because that means no memory hungry key loggers you have to have running in the background or download from some place and then update every week because they couldn't make one that works properly. Now you might be wondering how you can configure RGB keyboard side, but they did this in a really rather elegant way. There are two ways actually, a fast way and the precise one. The fast way is to press PN plus escape, which shows you a simple palette at the top that you can pick out of. For example, that one. This isn't exactly 16 million colors, but it works nice and quick. If you want to fine tune the color, you can set the individual levels of R, G and B using PN plus F6, F7 and F8. It takes a bit more time, obviously, but allows for a much more precise color control. It's a damn sight better than the Zolman solution of just showing random, seemingly identically ugly and nondescript colors and several pages of keycaps to pick from, that's for sure. Now you might be wondering, does this mean that you can also program macros truly on the fly and without having to use external software? And yes, it does. The macro programming and key remapping function does have some awkwardness and limitations, but it's overall pretty good. The first limitation is that macro programming and remapping can only be done in one of the three function layers, not the default layer. However, the FN layers aren't accessed per key using FN plus that key, they're switched to and then left there so you can work in an FN layer all the time with no difficulty. And the second limitation is, it's ridiculously complicated and you can't program or remap any keys that are not on the keyboard, but the second one warrants a bit more attention. See, in order to program a macro, let's say on layer 1, you need to press PN plus comma, which lights this LED red, then press FN plus right control, which makes it go white instead, then choose the key you want a macro on, let's say home, then the string you want to input, the manual actually <laughs> says it's the other way around, but I tested it and this appears to be wrong, so let's say that we want to input TEST, then you press PN again, then FN plus right control again, and then PN plus M if you want to return to the default layer. Now, I'm still not sure why they opted for both a PN key, whatever that's supposed to stand for, I guess punction, as well as an FN key, nor why they made it so ridiculously complicated, but after a few tries, admittedly, you get the hang of it. I was able to script this bit entirely from memory, actually. To be honest, I still would have had just one FN key for all the functions and made the PN key a macro key you would only use to program macros and nothing else. Because now I'm having to look up every time what functions are accessed with FN and which ones are accessed with PN. And with a dedicated macro key, you could simplify the programming procedure to just macro that key, it becomes that key, stop macro, and done. Another quick word about the keycaps, they're rather nice actually. They were made in-house and are double shot PBT, very thick, and I like the orange and black colour scheme a lot, even if it doesn't suit backlighting, although I'm not a big fan of RGB usually anyway. I'm in fact quite glad that they forsook the usual transparent lasered ABS ones and gave us a full set of decent caps to use with it, to be honest. The thinner text on some of the keycaps didn't come out super well, you can see that the thickness of the lettering is not that even, which is actually not uncommon on keycaps with thin text. I've seen it from other manufacturers too, although there are also companies that could do it much more reliably well. The build quality is pretty decent actually, the case is made out of plastic but it seems fairly tough and it uses a metal mounting plate bringing the total weight to about 800 grams which is not too bad for a 75% keyboard. Overall it's a pretty nice mid-budget ergonomic keyboard with good build quality, really nice keycaps, a good layout and plenty of functionality, although if you're looking for a hardcore ergo keyboard you'll find the lack of tenting adjustability and row staggering of the keys to be too conservative probably. In that case a more dedicated expensive alternative might be more up your street. 
Maybe the Comfort Ergo Nightmare keyboard might be more suitable. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.